Fuad al Kabarov once said, Humans dream of making Mars more like Earth while we continue to make Earth more like Mars. Keep this in mind as we discuss today the space competition between China, Russia, and the United States. And what does it mean for the future geopolitical landscape, not only on Earth, but also in space? My name is Dr. David Waralu. And my name is Dr. Ross Stewart. And you are watching Geopolitics in Conflict. Again, we would like to thank you for viewing, and we'd like to encourage everyone who is not subscribed to subscribe to our channel. We want to get the message out, and the more subscribers we have, the more YouTube will promote our videos. So thank you for doing it. Well, we also want to thank our Patreon members uh, for their continued support, and for you, if you like our videos and you like to support us, consider joining our Patreon membership, and we thank you all for your support. So back to our topic. What do you think? The space race is on again. Oh, I know. Some say no. There is no space race. I would say it is. <laughs> it is. It well, is we, indeed. In 1957, we saw the space race really begin with Sputnik. The Soviet Union put the first artificial satellite up. Mm -hmm. Then we pretty well saw the space race end in 1969 when Apollo 11 put an American astronaut on the moon. But boy, the stakes have really changed. What do you think? Exactly. Well, that was a reaction to the Russians, Yuri Gagarin, first, as the human, uh, uh, the first human to land on, Mar on, uh, on, on the moon. And that's what triggers the race uh, when NASA followed by it in, in the 60s, as we all know. So, uh, yeah, since that time, it has always been Russia and uh, the Soviet Union back then, and Russia today, and, and, and the United States. So it's almost like the competition was, was, uh, was uh, limited to two main players. Not anymore. Not anymore indeed, Ross, because now China is part of the, 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 the uh, space explorer, shall we say. Even though there are those who say, uh, well, China now have reached some strides, and which they did for the last couple of years. However, still, in comparison to the United States and Russia, China is considered a newcomer to the space. A very successful newcomer. They're on the moon. They're on Mars. And I'm sorry, they're not on the moon, are they? They're on Mars, but and they have a space station. Yeah. Well, they did go to the moon, the dark side of it. They landed oh, there. Right. They took yes. samples and came back. So uh, they are not in, in Mars. They landed some uh, their own rover, I believe. Whatever. They do have some really exploration per se. But, uh, but today we're going to be focusing mainly about the moon. Why is that? Some might say, well, you know, there is nothing in the moon. We've been there. We've done that. And yeah, maybe there is more to it. Yeah, maybe there's something on the moon that would make a life changing, be a, be a life changer for everything on the planet of Earth. Exactly. That was one of the questions has always been. What type of resources or uh, under, under that, ground, whatever that is in the moon, what type of elements are there that could be of use to us here? Well, hold there's silver, there's aluminum. Gold, diamond. Yeah. But those are so expensive to extract, and we have plenty of that on Earth already. Exactly. Maybe there's something else that's important here. Uh, maybe it's uh, helium. Maybe it's helium-3. Three. Three. Yes, we did hear about helium before, uh, which was, uh, you know, known to, we all went through school, when you start to study uh, uh, chemistry and all that stuff, it's one of the, in the table for, for the chemistry and all that stuff. But now it's helium-3. And why is that important? Uh, just for you to know, helium-3 was discovered by an, uh, an Australian uh, astrophysicist. I kind of forgot his name. So, no, no. So, but but that's, uh, uh, that's the one who discovered uh, the, uh, the helium-3. But helium-3, uh, it's uh, two protons and one neutrons, I believe. 
so it's very light. But that's not the point. The point in it is uh, the abundance of it on the moon's surface versus that on Earth. There are approximately 1,200,000 or more metric tons of it on the surface of the moon, which means it's easy to get to. Exactly. Yeah, because uh, as we all know, moon has no atmosphere and there is no magnetic field. So the deposits over the, the history of or the life for the universe, shall we say, is, it's been deposited on the moon's surface. Yes, it comes directly from the sun. Exactly. And our, and our atmosphere and magnetic poles blow it away. Exactly. But, it, but nothing on, on the moon blows it away. So it's accumulated it's there accumulated for there. That's billion true. years to however long. The moon's been there, That's I can't true. remember. That is correct. But the issue is not about just that. The issue now is about, you know, how are we going to manage, we, the Earth, countries, how are we going to manage now conflicts in space? For example, who's going to claim territory to what? How do you define the boundaries in, in, in space? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you take a look at the importance of helium-3, mm -hmm. and what we have is it is the energy source of the future. It is essential for nuclear fusion with no radioactive waste. Whatsoever, which is very, very sort of clean energy, shall It's we clean say. energy. Yeah. It's dramatically, it, it appears it's going to be dramatically cheaper than the current sources of energy. And it's plentiful. Exactly. That means the moon has enough to give all, the Earth all the power it needs for more than 10,000 years. That's a lot, yeah. And so the, the, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Russ. So the competition getting there and mining it and processing it ought to be fierce. Well, this is why the Chinese and the Russians decided to collaborate so they're going to put a research lab on the moon by 2030. So even NASA have announced that they're going to have to do something there as well. Step up their game? Well, because they are not going to be left behind. And all this uh, triggered the question as to the inter under international law, how are we going to manage that? You know, we all remember, uh, and I'm sure if you do or not, but we'll share it with you, is back in 1967, it was a treaty uh, that was signed among countries, uh, we call it the Out of Space Protocol, shall we say. Yeah. You know, as of February of 2021, which is this year, as of this year, Aras, there are about 111 countries that have agreed to that. 23 other countries are agreeing to it, to it but have not ratified it. So, uh, interesting enough that I, I came across some uh, 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 research indicating how, uh, for example, the United States, China, or even Russia did not sign some aspects of it. So, they left the door wide open. But the concern, the big concern is, now, whoever gets there first is going to claim that territory. And what we know is that to establish any kind of space a station on, on the moon, mm -hmm. there are a limited number of sweet spots. That is, there's the right shadows, there's the right sun, there is the right uh, water. Exactly. And so got, there might be some real fierce competition for those sweet spots. And that's going to be, the question is whether this is going to trigger some military action. For, for example, if you get there first, and I end up coming after, and I said, well, no, no, I need to have part of this because this is space. Right. There's no claim. So what am I going to do? Use force to remove you from there? What is going to lead to? And this is where that concern is coming as far as where this is going to lead to if there is no understanding how we're going to manage conflicts in space. Well, we're ha having a difficult time managing it now. On Earth. So. Here on Earth <laughs> without going to space. Exactly. And so the outlook of being able to manage it effectively off the planet looks remote. I do see it. That's how I see it moving forward. There are those who argue that, okay, well, if it is the case, how about if we coordinate with those countries, especially the moon is closer, rather than going to Mars, spending about a half trillion dollars for a 42 million mile uh, <laughs> journey. Yeah. So, uh, it, no. I don't know. I don't know. As, you know I, don't, I don't know the rationale for that. Some said, well, we're going to have to explore other places in, spa in space. Uh, I don't know. How would you well, the, justify... The, well, the moon is so close. Yeah. And everything else is much further away. Yeah. And we already know that there's a remarkably valuable asset on the first 
few feet of the soil on, on the moon. Exactly. But what I found very interesting and, and for you to know is that the moon as a structure is so perfect, is a symmetry. So uh, any other moons in our solar system, they are kind of like deformed and <laughs> yeah. all that. But the, our moon, it's incredible. It's perfect. Raises a lot of interesting questions, a little bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. But boy, are those interesting questions, maybe for another show. Indeed, except that one of them will be like, are we alone? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, which a question that has been coming up a lot. So, But that's not... Uh, the topic we're talking about here, uh, 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 as far as otherworldly being and so forth. But what we're talking about is to ensure that if we are to move forward, and it looks like the United States on one hand, China, Russia on another hand, they're going to be moving uh, into that direction of the competition uh, regarding space. Uh, uh, I don't agree with those who's saying, oh, there is no space race. No. I, I don't think so. There is. There is. And, and whoever gets its hand on this helium three will have a will have much a say into how the world operates, shall we say? It, you know, it's really a, absolutely an economic game changer and geopolitical game changer. Big time, right? Helium three is with with no scarcity of of energy in the planet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it being remarkably in, less expensive than it is right now. It's the real shakeup. Exactly, and that's, that's where things are going to be. And, and you add this, uh, for example, when you look at it, at least from the Russians, uh, the U.S., but mainly from the Chinese aspect, uh, from China's perspective is the advancement of uh, 5G technology and 6G. Oh, yeah. Those are going to play a very, very big role should conflicts erupt in space, which we hope they don't. Because here is the thing, the way I see it, with the military application uh, within space dimensions and so forth, you know, we all know that the United States has created what we call Space Force. Yes. So why would you create a Space Force? Unless you have intentions of, okay, there might be some assets we're going to need to defend. And rightly so. So other countries will have to think in those terms, like China, for example, with its 5G network and also working on its 6G the way I see it working, Ross, is that five, uh, uh, what China can do to mitigate this kind of risk or in case of a conflict is to retrofit 5G technology, which means they will be able to blind all the other satellites for the adversary. You know, you talk about an absolute military advantage. Blind the enemy. Well, if you blind the satellites, that's it. Well, yeah. you, we won't be able to see anything. Or you can laser them. So... Because we all know, a couple of years ago, China tested, uh, uh, shut down a satellite from Earth using laser. That was back, you know, if I am not mistaken, I don't recall exactly, but if I'm not mistaken, it was around 2007. So that technology has been around a long time. And it's kind of uh, raised a red flag inside the halls of the Pentagon. <laughs> the oh, I wonder why. <laughs> yeah. And, and actually, they did ask China for that, and China said, no, 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 that was one of the old satellites, is it debris? I don't know. Or did China tell the truth or not? I don't know, because it becomes the question of, you know, you're going to have to think about your own interests. So, You know, the hope is that there's going to be conversation among nations about this. I hope so, even though I don't see it going that direction, Ross. You know, and even if there are conversations and agreements, mm -hmm. some of the parties might not live up to those agreements. Well, it's because you're going to start to ask the question, what kind of international law that governs space? And we don't have any and to speak of. we don't have of. any. There's none. Uh, the treaty itself does mention the idea of that should a country explore something that has to coordinate with others. Well, why? Because they're going to be asking a question. Why should I coordinate with you? When yeah. you could do the same thing without coordinating with me. Especially when there's such animosity back home. Exactly. So then the problem, are we going to take this animosity from Earth into space? The prediction is? Yes. yes. There is that possibility for it. So, so that's basically where this is going to be going. The other thing that's going to this, this kind of competition is going to trigger was the re-emergence of new alliances. You know, who's going to side yeah. with the U.S. regarding space? Who's going to side with Russia and China regarding space? Oh, is this a dynamic question? Because we're looking at the underpinnings of the alliances that are currently existing 
starting to shake. Uh, exactly, because now you're hearing some conversation regarding, okay, what the Europeans going to do? Well, Europeans, they have their own European Space Agency. Uh, and usually the, uh, uh, the question becomes, are the European uh, Space agencies going to go with the China, Russia, or they're going to go with the US? It's hard to tell at this point. Even though my prediction, and this is my personal opinion, I believe that the, uh, the European Space Agency is going to go with the United States side with the US. But given the recent dynamics of what's taking place right now in Europe yes. regarding getting away from the security umbrella of the United States, who's to say that I might end up saying, well, sure, we can always coordinate with you, but we're going to go with the China and Russia this time. <laughs> it's because they're going to have to think of their own interests. As they should. As they should, like every other country. And this is where I see that cooperation between China and Russia. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. So it makes perfect sense for them to coordinate their efforts because uh, uh, Russia has the, the know-how. They have the booster rockets, yeah. perhaps the most powerful on the planet. Exactly. Matter of fact, a number of United States systems have been sent up via those via Russian them. booster yeah. rockets. And now China has access to them. Yeah, and China has also the funding and the technology. So you can just see they're cooperating. By the way, we used to pay a million dollar a seat for one astronaut oh, to wow. go on Soyuz. Yes, that's how much it used to cost. Each time we send anything up, a million dollar a seat. So, so uh, it becomes just a question of uh, uh, where this is going to lead to. And where will the confrontation uh, become an armed one? And it's very concerning if it is, and not only on Earth, but also in space. Oh, absolutely. So, so because the exploration of the space resources, you know, they can, yes, whoever gets its hand on it first, of course, they're going to benefit. But also, could it be a beneficial to all of us on Earth? You know, we got one planet here, so. You know, the resolution of this issue, that is, the major powers coming together to share the mm -hmm. magnificent resources around the moon, mm -hmm. might be the most significant question to answer in this century. It is indeed. And I, and I hope they can come to their senses in understanding. You know, you can't be looking at other countries as enemies forever. Right. You know, yes, this agreement is okay. You know, I don't have to agree with you on everything, but that does not mean we can't talk. Which is the real point of this. Yeah, that doesn't mean we can't talk. So. How, do, how do we inspire our government to want to talk to the Chinese and the Russians mm -hmm. about this highly significant issue. Boy, is it a challenge. It is indeed. And this is why we're hoping, you know, our shows, our programs provide at least some understanding for our viewers to start to see, uh, you know, these issues can be resolved if we only take a chance to sit down and have a conversation. Exactly. Not everything has to be animosity, the enemy, you and all that stuff. No. No, we can sometimes take a step back and reduce the tensions with cool heads, <laughs> start to have some conversation and figure out a way that works for all of us. Not what would just. you say is the biggest takeaway for our viewers? Well, the exploration of the Helium-3, it will be a game changer on a larger scale. You're talking about major sectors within any economy, within our daily life. Basically. Oh, absolutely. And, but speci speci specifically, I see it into the two sectors of the energy, but also on uh, 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 medical fields. I mean, the technology that what Helium-3 could provide as far as technology within the medical field and all that, it will be enormous. So we all can benefit from it. So uh, uh, one thing that you need to know is that access to Helium-3, benefiting from it is not going to happen overnight. It's a technology that is very complicated. It's going to need a lot of processing and so forth. So it will be a while before we see this. It'll be the next decade. Probably, yeah. But that doesn't mean we can't start now. If we don't start now, it won't be here in the next decade. Exactly, exactly. That's how we see it going. So maybe the takeaway from this is, no matter what you hear, the space race is on. Exactly. Exactly. So let's, let's hope there will be a, a peaceful one. Absolutely. Thank you for watching. Subscribe and let us know if you have other people you'd like us to interview for our show. And as always, stay informed. Till next time. Bye-bye.